Um, we're here to celebrate the life of Jerry Porter, who touched all of us, both intellectually, emotionally, and comedically. I, trans I treasure any number of his poems. most. And we're going to begin. Ray is going to give a summary, a precis, of uh, Jerry's thought. And then the rest of the time, and I'll hold him to 50 minutes. No, but now what? <laughs> Try to make it fit. <laughs> and, um, uh, and then uh, we'll, the floor will turn it over to a whole series of short reminiscences. Uh, now, there are many of us who want to reminisce about Gary, so I italicize the short. George. Did you have the screen? Uh, the sorry? I'll I have it. a slide. What slide? I got it. I got it. Okay. Um, like most people, I actually prefer right, uh, spontaneous talks. Ben talks. Can't hear. Can't hear. You have to hear. speak okay. very close to the mic. Yeah. Okay. Like most people, like most people, I prefer spontaneous Ben talks. Uh, you may want to hold up your hand, yeah. George. Yeah. Start again. Like most people, I prefer spontaneous to bed talks, but I, whenever I speak spontaneously, I, I go on far too long and only cover half of what I intended. So there's so much to cover about Jerry that I'm afraid I'm going to be. After a long illness, the philosopher Jerry Coder died on last November 29th. This was a great loss, not only to his family, but many friends, but also to philosophy and cognitive science. For reasons I hope will emerge in this brief remembrance, he was indisputably the most important philosopher of psychology of his generation. I first met Jerry on a wintry evening in February 1972. I had been a graduate student at Harvard for a few years, still to some extent under the spell of Wittgenstein and Klein, whose views then dominated the philosophy of mind there and elsewhere. My entry in class had been expressly warned by Klein's close colleague, Burton Drebin, to avoid, in Wittgenstein's famous phrase, the grip of the picture of traditional mentalism, which he claimed atomistically lay behind the work of Chomsky and Coder down the street at MIT. Is this fine? You can hear it over here? And I'm embarrassed to say, and I'm embarrassed to say I acquiesced for a while, until I began to wonder what life there was for psychology after Wittgenstein and Klein. And so I wandered down Mass Ave that evening to the seminar photo was writing on the manuscript of what would become his 1975 language poem. Well, he was in the middle of a sustained attack on those very figures, and on how, on how recent work in psycholinguistics refuted one after another of their claims. Of course, loyalty to myself and my graduate school demanded I make some token replies, which I beautifully set about doing. It went all right for about half an hour or so. But soon, in ways that many others who have argued with Bodo will recognize, I was overwhelmed by a torrent of objections from both psychology and philosophy that left me in the position of that familiar cartoon image of a man trying to withstand a hurricane by clinging horizontally to a door frame. I was blown out of the room. Fortunately, that was the time for a break, and so I wandered the halls for the next 15 minutes and considered what had been said. My God, it soon dawned on me. There is life after Wittgenstein, after all. Indeed, a hope at last for a serious, empirically grounded, mentalistic psychology. I went back and joined the discussion, which of course I haven't left since. In addition to the sheer intellectual benefit of meeting him, I was also immediately impressed by his philosophical style. He argued with astounding energy, intelligence, wit, imagination, integrity, and goodwill. In my and many others' experience, one never felt in the least personally attacked. I acknowledge that others in the field may have felt The philosopher Steve Ross expressed very well my enduring impression in his own short obituary on the Daily News blog. Steve managed the colloquia series at the Cooney Graduate Center for many years, for which Jerry was often a speaker. And Steve recalls, <clears throat> he was always in touch with what made a philosophical view both tempting and a bit of a burden. He was one of the very few who never pretended that just because he thought a particular view right, that, that did not for a moment meant he could not see how in these difficulties others could reasonably find, find, find fatal. When Jerry took questions, you felt, here is someone who feels both the power and the provisional nature of philosophy. 
The vigor and excitement of arguing with Jerry was well captured in a marvelous simile of the Andenans. <coughs> this is something Gary and I quoted uh, in our anthology uh, some years ago. Those philosophers are like old beds. You jump on them and sink deep into qualifications, revisions, and addenda. But Fodor's like a trampoline. You jump on him, and he springs back, presenting claims twice as trenchant and outrageous. If some of us can see further, it's from Jump on Jerry. <laughs> Leave us, leaving aside just who winds up seeing further, there's no question that exchanges for Jerry were invariably exciting and fruitful, with one co frequently coming away finding the world looking very different, which is not to apply more critical. For good glimpses of Jerry in action, one can view several videos available online under his name on YouTube, and I commend them to you. Four or five, they're quite good. Colin McGinn, in a, 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 a remark in 2002, uh, noted both these lively aspects. But also, what many of us also sometimes observed, his surprising shyness and sensitivity. Uh, this is a quote from Colin. Fodor is a gentle man inside a burly body, and prone to an even burlier style of arguing. He is shy and voluble at the same time, a formidable polemicist burdened with a sensitive soul. Shy indeed he was. In one of his diary entries for the London Review of Books, as we'll see in the series, the London Review of Books, <coughs> various uh, people reminiscent about their lives, uh, Jerry wrote quite self-revealingly, this is from Jerry, I am pathologically easily embarrassed. I would rather be mugged than shout for help in a public place. I suppose I could be prepared to shout for help in the privacy of my own home, among consenting adults. But what good would that do? <laughs> Likewise, I must never go to those trendy plays in some of small off-off-Broadway theaters, where God knows what indignities may be presented <laughs> on the audience in pursuit of his edification of entertainment. If I'm forced to go to one, I sit in the middle of a row in the middle of the house where peripatetic actors can't get at me. What have I got to lose? I nerve the starters. <laughs> the shyness was, I suspect, connected to what seems to be true of many people with great wit, that it was somehow linked to a depressive strain, which always seemed, in fact, not far in the background with Jerry. He was peculiarly loath to express these or other personal feelings directly, but they and his empathy for others suffering were often revealed in his remarks on opera and literature, to which I'll return later. <coughs> to which I'll return later. When the children's entertainer, Mr. Rogers, uh, died, Jerry expressed real sadness for the loss of someone who he greatly admired for his ability to connect so genuinely with children and their unhappiness. He stressed that. <coughs> It's worth noting that many people who all, many people also witnessed Jerry's being sometimes extraordinarily patient, empathic, and helpful with colleagues and students, many of whom most important remembrances of him at the David and Splog, and some of whom will provide stories today. Understandably, though, this shyness and vulnerability were likely lost on many of us, on many who were put off by just how aggressive, rhetorical, and relentlessly, relentless he could be in argument. A one-time student of Fodor's, Daniel Kaufman, posted the sort, of, the sort of anecdote that doubtless exasperated many. This is a quote from uh, Daniel Kaufman from the Daily News Web uh, 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 blog. <clears throat> Funnily enough, precisely what others disliked so much about Fodor is what I loved about him. I recall one occasion in particular in which a speaker had come to the weekly colloquium to deliver what he thought was a scathing critique of some aspect of Fodor's work. As the talk went on, I could see Jerry getting more and more agitated constantly shifting his rather than substantial body in a chair that was far too small for him, rocking back and forth, burying his head in his hands, sporadically erupting in frustrated grunts and snorts, until finally he couldn't take it anymore. There's only so much frustration one can express while sitting in a tiny chair. And he leaped up, rushed to the board behind the guy, where he proceeded to scribble the refutation of the talk while it was still being given. <laughs> The speaker tried to carry on, but his eyes kept straying sideways to the board, where, where Jerry was squatting and scribbling, and finally he lost the thread and just sort of mumbled his way from the rest. <laughs> now, I don't think, I really don't think one should excuse this sort of self-indulgence, <clears throat> and I don't intend to, <clears throat> but it's worth stressing that for many of us, it really didn't seem so much self-indulgence. Jerry never really seemed particularly self-aggrandizing. So much as simply obsession to the point of rudeness with what he regarded as getting the issues right. In any case, many of us who withstood his old thoughts, and many of us you know, are quite familiar with that kind of behavior, uh, do think he was right enough that it was usually worth it. Usually. Not always, but usually. Few gifts come for free. <clears throat> his background and career. 
<clears throat> Jerry once said to me that if you were to write an autobiography, it would begin, the best moments of my life are counterfactual. <laughs> now I don't <laughs> Now I don't have quite the space here to go into all the counterfacts. So I'll just say as best I can to the actual ones. Jerry Ellen Foder was born in New York City uh, on April 22nd, 1935, the son of Andrew Foder, a research bacteriologist and an apparently quite cultured Hungarian recent Hungarian immigrant, and the former K. Rubens. Uh, who I believe was descended from uh, 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 political uh, figures in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> For various reasons, uh, Jerry was uh, raised uh, primarily by his mother and a grandmother, whose readers of his work will recognize as one of the main internal interlocutors. <laughs> this, I just thought this image is so extraordinary that the only image I've ever done. That is. That is Granny. That's <laughs> little Jerry there. And that's Granddad peeping over her shoulder. And you can see that she's a formidable presence uh, here and in his mind for the rest of his life. Okay, you can go back to the first slide. <laughs> I just think that's an extraordinary image. Uh, he attended Forest Hills High School in Queens and then Columbia University, where he studied with Sidney Morgan Messer and author Donto. He received his A.B. degree, summa cum laude, in 1956, and went on to graduate school in philosophy at Princeton, receiving his Ph.D. in 1960 under the direction of Hillary Putnam. And then he spent a year, 1960-61, at Oxford. I suspect Morgan Besser and Putnam were his most significant mentors, especially the latter, Putnam, who in the late 1950s had begun to develop his realist approaches to science and his so-called functionalist approaches to the mind, which emphasized the analogy between minds and computers. From 1959 until 1986, Foda was on the faculty of MIT. In 1986 until 1988, he was a full professor at the City University of New York. And from 1988 until his retirement in 2016, he was at the State University of New Jersey, Rutgers here, uh, where at his death he was an heiress. In 1957, Jerry married Iris Goldstein, Foder, who is still a practicing uh, psycho psychologist in New York City. Uh, they divorced in 1968, and a few years later he married the psycholinguist Janet Dean Foder, who had come to MIT to study with Chomsky, and with whom Jerry was soon collaborating in experiments on speech perception. Okay, his contributions to uh, science. Uh, in an obituary for Jerry, uh, Chomsky recently wrote, quote, Jerry Foder was one of the founders of contemporary cognitive science and a leader in its development over the years, and a major figure in contemporary philosophy of language and mind. His highly innovative contributions have had a broad influence as well in linguistics and psychology of language. His computational representational theory of mind has for years been the gold standard in the field. <clears throat> his analysis of concept and of the it's a funny expression to use for Chomsky, yeah, for Foder, but it was his analysis of concepts and the role of language of thought are unsurpassed in their depth and import. Always a sparkling wit and style. A wonderful person and a valued friend for 60 years. I'll return to Jerry's wit and style in due course. In this, I hope, not too long and difficult section, I'll try to sketch his main views and contributions to the cognitive revolution he joined Chomsky in initiating. I dearly hope I won't be guilty of what Jerry, at the beginning of quadrilateral of mine, worries about. Uh, he, he described as the scholarship that turns a butterfly into a caterpillar. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry's original interest in enlarging literary, leading him to complete his senior thesis, I believe, I haven't been able to confirm this, uh, on Kierkegaard. Uh, I remember having a few conversations with him about Kierkegaard and being startled by how much he knew about it, uh, and how what a feel he had for getting Christianity. It's quite startling. Uh, and he said he'd done his thesis on, uh, on Kierkegaard. In fact, when he initially went to MIT in 1959, he was hired to teach humanities, bringing culture to the engineers. But there he met Chomsky, and inspired by his work as well as by Putnam's, he began a relentless attack on the various forms of anti-realism about psychology that had dominated mainstream philosophy and psychology since the 1920s. Contrary to the insistence of various kinds of behaviorists, from Skinner and Klein to Wittgenstein and Ryle, 
to most recently Dan Devitt. Jerry argued that psychology should study real internal mental competencies and processes which might be only indirectly manifested in the complexity of ordinary behavior. Claims about the mind should, like the claims of any science, be grounded in lawful, empirically informed explanation about the systematic realities that underlie what we observe on the surface. More traditional a priori epistemology, metaphysics, and folk thought and talk about ordinary behavior he regarded as secondary, if relevant at all. In his seminal 1975 book, The Language of Thought, Jerry went on to articulate and defend a computational theory of mental processes that he argued provided the only serious framework, the only President Johnson as he ever grabbed in the book, for actual psychological research. Propositional attitudes, such as belief, preference, and expectation, were to be treated as computational relations to sentences in a language of thought that was encoded in the brain. In that book, and in much subsequent work, he argued that only such an approach could capture the compositional structure, productivity, and what he called systematicity of thought. Possible thoughts have a recursive logical structure, which allows someone who can think of P to be able to think logical permutations of P. For example, someone can think, I'll leave if he speaks, if and only if she can think, I'll speak if he leaves. <laughs> <coughs> the LOT hypothesis, the language of thought hypothesis, also seemed to him the only way of capturing Proposed mechanisms of language acquisition, hypothesis confirmation, and decision making, both in perception and in ordinary and scientific reasoning. After all, standards, uh, standard rules of inference in logic are defined over semantically valuable sentential strings, which are also the natural objects of Bayesian probability inferences and patterns of formal decision theory. Okay, uh, this was actually uh, uh, something that only became clear to me in, in preparing these remarks, namely the central role of confirmation of truth in so much of his thought. <clears throat> a background view that played a surprisingly wide role in Fodor's thought is a doctrine called confirmation of holism, what I'll call it, I'll for short, confirm holism, according to which, in Quine's canonical formulation, our beliefs confront the tribunal of experience only as a corporate body. That's from Quine, famous in Quine, 1953. To God. Klein was expanding on an observation of Pierre Dunay, who drew attention to how a scientist testing a hypothesis and confronted with a failed prediction doesn't automatically reject the hypothesis, but we usually check out any number of auxiliary hypotheses regarding the conditions of the experiment, the reliability of the apparatus, and the plausibility of any number of background beliefs. Indeed, it would certainly appear that virtually any background belief could be the source of error, including even one's understanding of logic, arithmetic, and the meanings of words. Now, no one has nearly an adequate theory of how a scientist proceeds to choose where exactly among these options an error might lie. Fodor, Fodor also follows Quine in thinking that the choice is subject to variation in terms of holistic considerations, of e.g. the conservatism, generality, simplicity, and modesty of one's systems of beliefs on the whole. Another moral that Fodor, interesting moral that Fodor took from Quine's view is that confirmation was an a posteriori, or empirical matter of what was in fact causally connected to what in the actual world. Not a matter to be settled by a priori reason, least of all by reflection on the meanings of what words or concepts. <laughs> Confirm holism plays a role in a surprising number of Fodor's distinctive views, which I'll discuss in turn. <clears throat> Fodor at one point interestingly remarked, I often have the feeling that I'm just saying what Klein would have said, but for his empiricism. <laughs> As I just suggested, Fodor joins Quine in thinking confirm holism undermines the traditional presumption of an analytic synthetic distinction and a conceptual role semantics. That's 3.21. Unlike Quine, however, Fodor still thinks that determinate semantics is possible, and that's because one can turn to a mentalistic externalist referentialism to ground intentional content. Content that would be section 3.22. Confirm holism also figures in at least one of his main arguments for the notorious mad dog nativism, or his thesis that virtually all concepts are innate. It plays an interesting contrastive role in his celebrated hypothesis about the modularity of perceptual systems, 3.24, and it's at the heart of his claims about the, for many, surprising limits of computational psychology, 3.25. Okay, 3.21, the issue of uh, analyticity. In early work in the 1960s with Gerald Katz, who had been a fellow graduate student in Princeton, Fodor also defended the version of an internalist semantics that he thought cohered with Chomsky's program in linguistics and underwrote traditional philosophical claims about the analytic. However, unlike Katz, he soon became persuaded that there was no way to save an internalist semantics from the attacks on analyticities raised by Klein. 
In particular, by Quine's challenge to distinguish intuitions about meaning from simply tenacious beliefs. In view of confirmed holism, what today may be taken as to be analytic, may tomorrow, with enough pressure from other beliefs, be found to be false. As Putnam pointed out, contra uh, Gerald Kent, even so humdrum and apparent analyticity as cats or animals could be abandoned if the, come to think of it rather sinister, little things turned out to be robots from Mars. <coughs> Fodor argued that especially this latter sort of revisability had deep implications for psychology. Deeming any internal conceptual duty, any internal conceptual role semantics to a semantic holism that would render psychological generalization and explanation possible. Indeed, in his 1998 concepts book, he argued that the idea that a theory of meaning should be grounded in the role or use of a word or concept is, quote, where cognitive science went wrong. The only content a concept need have is what it contributes to a publicly shared compositional structure. And he thinks this can only be provided by an externalist referential semantics. Okay, referentials. Specifically, Fodor developed a version of the informational semantics originally proposed by Fred Gretzky, whereby the content of a mental state or symbol was provided by some kind of covariant relation it bore to a real or perhaps only possible external phenomenon. As Fodor uh, noted, the idea actually goes back to Skinner and Quine. Fodor just wanted to apply it mentalistically in a way that they didn't. As he perversely put it, I can't, I can't find where the quote is, but it's a great line. Skinner and Quine were right about meaning. They were just wrong about Quine. Initially, Fodor toyed with a co-variation under ideal and aesthetic conditions, uh, but soon came to worry that this couldn't be spelled out in a way that avoided the intentionality to be explained. And so, even and so even before that suggestion was published, he hit upon the idea that all that really mattered was that there was a lawful co-variation under some or other circumstances that provided the basis upon which all of the tokenings of the symbol asymmetry be dependent. The causal asymmetry would suffice all by itself. This is what became his notorious asymmetry dependency theory. Content that he defended with extraordinary ingenuity, if not universal acclaim. In his 1987 uh, uh, psychosemantics, in his more, in more qualified ways, in his theory of content, and in his, re in his reply to critics, in the very in my uh, anthology of uh, criticisms of his work. <clears throat> Despite all this referential, referentialism, Fodor did acknowledge that more needed to be said to quell the intuitions that there was some aspect of content that was not extensional even in his extended counterfactual sense. And in a number of books and articles from the mid-1990s, The Elm and the Expert, the 1998 Concepts book, right up until his last book in 2016 was then in Polition. Right um, uh, <clears throat> Minds about meetings. He struggled with various ways of explaining away what he, appeared, what he appreciated with the appearances of internal, narrow content. The ways are so variegated and complex that I must leave it as an exercise to the audience. <laughs> Mad dog nativism. Contra holism plays a role in another of Fodor's famous or notorious claims, what came to be called as mad dog nativism. And here I condense a much more complex treatment of several different versions of his his views. Given there are no analyticities, as he thinks contra holism leads us to expect, then concepts can't be decomposed, and so they can't be learned by constructing them from experience, as empiricists have proposed. Rather, they must be merely activated by experiences that trigger prototypes of them. But then at least the disposition for the concepts to be so activated must be innate. In which case, the expressive power of the child's mind is not increased by experience, even if the activation of the innate concept is. Of the innate concept is. As he and Chomsky often put it, contrary to a fundamental impulse of empiricism, the basic structure of people's mind is not a reflection of the exogenous environment, but have endogenous features of their physiology. So, I think a very deep point that Trump be stressed in all their work. Fodor concluded that children must be born with the power to express all the concepts they will ever acquire, i.e., with virtually all the concepts expressed by single morphemes in natural organism. This view, mad dog nativism, is of course widely regarded as preposterous. Fodor was not unaware of this reaction. <laughs> Michael Devitt, lovely uh, note he sent me, has recounted a conversation he had with Jerry when he first met him. This is Michael Douglas' uh, reminiscence. Uh, my first talk. Before we get going, Jerry, I think I should tell you that I've recently described in print one of your views as wildly implausible. <laughs> Jerry looked interested, and I went on. 
But since writing that, I've come to think that I misunderstood your view, says Michael. The one about innate concepts. I overlooked the full significance of your talk of triggering. I still felt what I now took the view to be in, to be in light of that talk of triggering and asked, is that your view? It's a better view. Jerry responded, yes, that's it. A pause. Then with more than a touch of anxiety, it's still pretty impossible, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone skeptical of the view, however, you know, really it's important that anybody skeptical of the view must be prepared to deal with both arguments to really the interesting part, and the embarrassing fact that I uh, stressed, uh, especially in the concepts book, that successful analyses of most words simply don't seem to be available. Okay, psycholinguistics and modularity. <clears throat> Beginning in the 1960s at MIT, where he come to hold a joint appointment in both the philosophy and psychology departments, Jerry began undertaking some experimental work in psycholinguistics, mostly with Tom Bever and Meryl Garrett. He and Bever published some famous click experiments in which perceptual sensitivity to linguistic structure seemed manifested in the ways listeners displaced the location of bursts of white noises right, uh, played at various points in a heard sentence. And then following up on his client skepticism about the analytic, he and Janet and Merrill uh, also ran some interesting experiments challenging lexical decomposition by showing such decomposition seemed not to show up in any response time of listeners to presumably decomposed items. A result related to the derivational theory of complexity, according to which processing times of sentences should correspond to their derivational complexity in a Chomsky of linguistics. Uh, in a Chomsky of syntax. Although widely discussed at the time, neither result has remained influential. The gulf between competence and performance seemed to mention wider than they believed. Although, interestingly enough, a version of the derivational theory is actually being reconsidered by some Chomskyans, uh, so we're in Colin Phillips and others that come up in their own. <clears throat> Continuing to work with Garrett and then with Zen and Volition, Jerry began to develop what emerged as his most influential work for psychologists, his 1983 monograph, The Modularity of Mind. Here, Fodor urged a computational approach to perceptual systems, among which he significantly included linguistic parsing. Unlike central systems, these systems, these perceptual systems, he argued, are exceptionally fast, automatic, and uh, expression he and Zen uh, invented, uh, informationally encapsulated, insensitive to the definite kinds of information that our central cognitive systems routinely processes. Our central cognitive system routinely processes. Linguistic perception occurs about as fast as any brain process can. One can't hear one's native language's noise, you have to hear his language. And perceptual illusions, like the middle liar, for example, are resistant to our, explicit, our explicitly learning about them. Okay, the limits of computationalism. An issue that Jerry mentioned in his 1983 book, Bajaleri book, but didn't fully address there, was his, for many, slightly surprising pessimism about the very computational theory of mind he had earlier seemed to propose. In reply to Stephen Pinker's endorsement of the computational view in his Pinker's 1997 book, How the Mind Works, Fodor 2000 argued that, in fact, the mind doesn't work that way. <laughs> While computational processes over representations in a language thought might explain those parts of mental processing, such as processing, about which current theorizing seems promising and might be necessary for an account of central cognition, he thinks it, will be, uh, it is doubtful it will be sufficient for it. For it is in the central system of reasoning that Quine's confirm holism seems to be fully evident. Jerry pointed out that confirm holism actually involves at least two claims that central reasoning is Quinean are subject to valuation in terms of holistic properties, such as conservatives and simplicity, and isotropic. Any belief is in principle relevant to the truth value of any other belief. But if this is true, then it's doubtful that classical computation could account for it. After all, in Turing's famous characterization, computation is fundamentally a local affair, in terms of which non-local finding isotropic confirmation would seem to be computationally intractable. In pressing the story, Fodor can be regarded as echoing Descartes' prescient observation, in his discourse by method, <clears throat> that although machines might be designed to deal with many specific cognitive problems, they are incapable of what seems to be what Descartes called the universal reason, displayed by people, a fact that many, uh, Fodor and many others think has been borne out by the limitations of efforts in artificial intelligence. Physical. Autonomous sciences. Unlike Descartes, however, Fodor was a committed physicalist. Uh, a committed physicalist. 
But his own third version of physicalism was considerably weaker than many traditional ones. In particular, it was non-reductive. There was no requirement that there be biconditional bridge laws linking the phenomena of some special science, like psychology, to the underlying phenomena of physics. In the first chapter of his 1975, he famous, famously argued that special sciences should be pursued relatively autonomously from deeper physical theories whose regularities they may simply classify. Thus, psychology may classify events as belonging to the same psychological type that differ in neurophysiological properties. And neurophysiology might classify events belonging to the same neurological type that differ in their psychological properties. Solipsism. A more complex issue is the exact relation Fodor saw between mentalistic explanation in psychology and the underlying physics. In a, a time much discussed paper, Methodological Solipsism as a Research Strategy in Cognitive Psychology, Fodor argued that a computational psychology depends upon mere formal syntactically specified operations which can be satisfied by a machine regardless of what environment the machine was in. Indeed, it could be a solipsistic brain in a mountain. On the other hand, in contrast to Stephen Stitch, uh, he insisted that psychological laws and explanations, not the actual mediating processes, but the laws and explanations, are uh, quantified over and are therefore committed to the intentional content of the syntactic states. The above non-reductionist suggestion raises, however, a difficult question. If physics provides the metaphysical basis for any true explanation of phenomena at higher micro levels, no matter how much they may be cross-classified, how could there be any explanatory non-physical macro properties? If intentional content isn't a physical property, how could it be explanatory? For discussion of this rather difficult issue, see Jack Bolton Kim's famous work, as well as uh, Ernie and Gary uh, Forrest and Gary Lowers, uh, uh, Gary and Gary's Anthony's uh, more recent piece as well as Jerry's own last words on the topic. This is from, I think, the last time he wrote on this topic, from 1990. <clears throat> Says Jerry. Ah, I'm not really concerned that it matters very much whether the mental is physical, still less that it matters whether we can prove that it is. Whereas, if it isn't literally true that my wanting is causally responsible for my reaching, and my itching is causally responsible for my scratching, and my believing is causally responsible for my saying, if none of that is literally true, then practically everything I believe about anything is false. It's the end of the world. <laughs> to, these, uh, to the, these aspects of folk psychology, he was perhaps more committed, actually, than other cognitive scientists. Iconoclasm. <coughs> Against ignoring empiricists. A few years ago, I was asked to introduce Jerry for his, in many quarters now infamous, talk on Darwin. I was suddenly struck by how that talk was really only the last in a long string of attacks Jerry had made on one figure and our prevailing wisdom after another. And couldn't help remarking that it seemed to me that what Jerry most wanted to be when he grew up, grew up was an all volunteer me. I mentioned this because afterwards Jerry came up to me and beaming said, that was exactly right. <laughs> in any case, here's the string of iconoclasms. Beginning in his 1968 psychological explanation, he went after Wittgenstein, Riles, and Skinner's version, various versions of behaviorism. In his 1972 and 1975, he challenged Vygotsky's and Piaget's exper experiential accounts of concept acquisition, the one I'm going to mention. In his 1978, he criticized Johnson and Merritt's procedural semantics. In their 1981, he and uh, Zenon criticized uh, John Gibson's ecological uh, psychology. And in their 1988, they roundly criticized the then nation of uh, connections to Frobisch's cognition, claiming they could nomologically account for a manifestly compositionally productive and systematic structure of thought. That's where the systematicity argument had first emerged. <clears throat> a few years later, he and Ernie Latour mounted an argument against the meaning holism that had become popular in many quarters. And then in his own, uh, Jerry, Jerry's 1998 and 2004, uh, he deployed again Quanian considerations against various versions of conceptual role semantics. Where he thought not only cognitive science, but, quote, the whole of the 20th century had gone wrong. <laughs> Virtually all the arguments pressed either on essentially the same uh, points about confirmed holism and the challenge it raises to conceptual role semantics, or on the argument that Chomsky and he, he originally raised against Skinner against an excessively empiric empiricist presumption about ways in which the psychology of an organism is supposed to be a reflection of its environmental history. The Darwin. This last issue is at the heart of one of the. Uh, this last issue of the, uh, 
endogenous versus exogenous uh, dependencies. Uh, this last issue is at the heart of one of his last main works, the 2010 AD attack on Darwinian selectionism that he undertook with his fellow cognitive science, uh, cognitive scientist Massimo Piatelli Palmarini. The book has generated considerable controversy, many biologists being skeptical of being second guessed by non biologists, although Piatelli Palmarini does adduce considerable biological evidence as well as independent research by, by biologists in support of their claim. Not being a biologist, I won't try to enter that fray. But at least Floder's part of the argument turned largely on complex claims that were not so much about biology, but about the nature of explanation. These claims may be controversial and inconclusive, but in the few remarks here I hope to indicate whether they're not quite as frivolous as many of the critics of the volume have claimed. Note, first of all, that Floder is not for a moment disputing Darwin's phylogenetic hypothesis about the origin of species. He was not remotely a creationist, nor does he think that somehow the explanation of human faculties must in principle be different from the explanation of the traits of other animals. <coughs> As some uh, put it up, the critics of the volume seem to think. <coughs> he is simply concerned with what he regards as a spurious explanatory force, selectionist explanations, he believes, which he needs to display. There are two tiers to Fodor's quarrel with selectionism. The first is a generalization of the argument against Skinner about where the deeper explanations of cognitive traits lie. And both for Chomsky's reasons and for the reasons we discussed earlier, Fodor believed it lay in a creature's innate structure. And then, just as Skinner saw himself as applying Darwin's natural selection to individual ontogeny, Fodor generalized his critique of Skinner back to Darwin. He doubted the selection story has a significant role to play in the explanation of any traits. Again, like Chomsky, he insisted that an animal's traits are better explained not by endogenous biological structure, by, but by exogenous features that uh, are better explained not by, sorry, are better explained by endogenous biological structure, and not by exogenous features of the environment. Even if, for example, grammatical, logical, or digestive abilities <coughs> provided our ancestors with some selective advantage, the structure of those abilities are more likely to be explained by structural effects rooted in organisms, chemistry, and biology than by environmental exigencies. Unlike Chomsky, however, Fodor wasn't satisfied with nearly a relatively low level empirical objection to Darwin. He thought there was a deeper philosophical issue about the logic of selection. In order for selection to provide an explanation of a trait, the trait must not only be selected, but selected for, in a phrase of Elliot Sober and Karen Neanders, uh, who discussed it great length. But selection for is an intentional concept, <clears throat> requiring a difference between coextensive properties. The standard example, the heart pump, pumps if normally it thumps. But presumably it was its pumping that was selected for, not the coextensive pumping. Fodor then argues that coextensive properties can be distinguished only if either there are laws involving them, or there are intentional processes such as breeding or sexual selection that distinguish them. He argues that there are in general no laws of selected properties, and that apart from sexual selection, selected properties aren't intentionally selected. As he put essentially the, same, essentially the same point in relation to selectionist tibiosemantic accounts of the cognitive content of the frog's mind, <clears throat> Darwin cares how many flies you eat, but not what description you eat them under. <laughs> Without intentionality, Fodor goes on to argue, selection can explain only the evolution of whole organisms, not of any specific trait. It's entire polar bears, not their girth, coloration, or stocky claws in isolation that beat out their rivals. As my student Andrew Noel nicely put the point, echoing yet again confirm holism, quote, this is my student Andrew, an animal's traits beat the tribunal of mortality only as a corporate body. <laughs> Whether Fodor is right or wrong about any of this has been forcefully disputed. See the video exchange between him and Elliot Sober uh, on YouTube, uh, as well as Ned and uh, Block and Paul Kitcher's uh, critique. Uh, and then Norbert Norfolk also see Norbert Hornstein's. Uh, 2010 um, uh, defense of Fodor. But note that unlike the first, the first largely empirical issue uh, about you know, biology, uh, these latter uh, issues are largely conceptual ones about the nature of causal explanation, not specifically about biology, and so are unlikely to be refuted by considerations of biology alone. The conceptual issues are complex, and Jerry's claims are, characteristically, hyperbolic. But I submit his discussion should not be dismissed as casually as many have been inclined to do. Stylistic and use of reasons. 
Hoder's writings display some striking, striking idiosyncrasies. In addition, in his addition to his often being a bit hyperbolic, he was almost compulsively jocular, and this sometimes led readers to dismiss his writings as unserious. This would be a bad mistake. Hoder's jokes were invariably quite serious and philosophically insightful. <laughs> Several have come to mind. Uh, Several have come to mind. Preceding the above observation about how Darwin cares only about how many flies the frog eats, not the description of he eats them under, he wittily quotes a famous line from Bertolt Brecht's Three Penny Opera. Erst tut das Fressen, dann kommt die Moral. Roughly, first comes the grub, then comes the morals. Another, commenting on Hilary Putnam's observation about how speakers defer to experts to ground the reference of their terms. What philosophers call linguistic de deference is actually the use of experts as instruments. Not Marxist division of labor and semantics, but capitalist exploitation and epistemology. <laughs> and in a succinct rebuttal of scientific instrumentalism, if theories are merely instruments for predictive experience, why not just close your eyes and plug up your ears? Gee, why didn't you even think of that? <laughs> Indeed, it can't be stressed enough that Jerry's sometimes sharp jokes were usually backed up by rich argumentation. A number of people have complained about an amusing parody he made of Pink, uh, Stephen Pinker's uh, explanation of why we read fiction. In the following uh, with exchange, uh, uh, quotes, uh, beginning with Pinker. Pinker. Fictional narratives supply us with a mental catalog of the fatal conundrums we might face someday and the outcomes of strategies we could deploy in them. What are the options if I would suspect that my uncle killed my father, took his position, and married my mother? <laughs> Good question! <laughs> or, here Voter summarizes Wagner's ring. What if it turned out that having just used What if it turns out that having just used the ring that I got by kidnapping a dwarf to pay off the giants and build me a new castle, I should discover that there's a very ring that I need in order to continue to be immortal and rule the world? It's important to think out the options <laughs> because a thing like that <laughs> a thing like that can happen to anybody. <laughs> 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 One critic found this quote deliberately obtuse and highly superficial reading of Pinker's play. <laughs> of course, as the critic goes on to say, Pinker has an obvious rejoinder. Fiction provides us with strategies for conundrums we might encounter at a suitable level of abstraction. <laughs> Thus, perhaps, Hamlet instructs us about avenging grievous wrongs in Wagner's ring about sacrificing love for power. But one does hesitate to wonder what Lohengrin and Oedipus Rex were constructing us to do. Foder was, of course, well aware of such a rejoinder. He resorted to caricature to dramatize his real point, but it seemed to him preposterous to think of literature, some of which he loved intensely, in such a utilitarian way, especially in ways that struck him to be the result of a tyrannical selectionism that insisted somehow in finding some purpose or function to every significant human trait which is not to say that a trait like reading fiction might not sometimes have happy effects. This was a serious theme of both the whole of his 1998 review, in which the caricature appeared, and which should be required reading for anyone interested in evolutionary psychology, as well as, of course, of his general skepticism about darkness and selectionism that we discussed above. Whatever one may think of these pieces, these pieces, these pieces controversial conclusions, the arguments for them are hardly obtuse or superficial. Literary folksy style, but also scientific. Another idiosyncrasy. I mentioned earlier his concern with science as opposed to ordinary talk. This concern can, however, sometimes seem belied by the folksy informal character of much of his philosophical writing. I once asked him, Jerry, you probably know more scientific psychology than any other philosopher. Why, when you give an example of a psychological law, do you take a trivial folk example such as Eating potato chips can make you want to eat more, instead of any serious ones from psychology, from actual psychology. Without hesitation, he replied, citing the science would be vulgar. <laughs> this struck me as a, as a sincere and deeply revealing remark about his, peculiar, about his peculiar sensibility. But it shouldn't lead readers to think that he didn't take the science entirely seriously. In fact, Jerry dealt quite straightforwardly with the science when he took himself to be addressing a scientific audience as in his then classic 1974, very excellent text with uh, Beverly and Garrett, the Psychology of Language, and in his Montefiore in Mind. Absent in those works is much of the usual wit and rhetoric, 
And particularly the modularity book has come to figure in clinical psychology as a standard work whose suggestions have been developed in a number of rich and different ways. But in addressing philosophical audiences, Jerry seems to have felt, not unlike some important philosophers before him, Hume and Klein come to mind, uh, the need to be more literary and sophisticated. And he was quite capable of being so, as in screen reviews and diary entries for the Times Literary Supplement and the London Review of Books richly attest. Many of these, such as the ones involving the above comment about Pinker, are collected in his ominously titled In Critical Condition. <clears throat> these, Sunday pieces, these Sunday pieces make for entertaining reading on a variety of topics of more general interest, from evolutionary psychology to neuroscience, consciousness, an issue he usually scrupulously avoided, and synoptic books on philosophy, to Fredestier, Puccini, Wagner, and opera in general. So, last three of wider interests. Indeed, these latter writings reveal Fodor's passion equally for the arts as for science. He had an intense, lifelong love of ballet, opera, art, and literature. From Anthony Powell's Dance to the Music of Time, to Murasaki Shikubu's, uh, Shikubu's uh, Tale of Genji, to virtually all the works of Shakespeare and Henry James, who he adored. From adolescence on, he thought of, the, of ballet as one of the most perfect of the arts, particularly the work of George Balanchine, whose portrait hung on his office wall next to that of Sidney Professor. It also fed scare. His taste in painting was quite conservative, and not extending beyond Matisse, and he sometimes had what seemed to be puzzling views. A number of us had gone with him to see the Barnes collection in Philadelphia, and at a certain point we noticed we seemed to have lost Jerry. We eventually found him. A seated before, uh, to our eyes, rather schmaltzy Renoir portrait of a woman in a florid hat. We wondered what so entranced him. So like St. Paul, he murmured, the difficulty of dealing with sensual temptation. <laughs> His love of music was intense, but relatively limited to opera, particularly mezzo sopranos. I think he thought Frederica von Stadas Carabino in Mozart's Marriage of Figaro was the ultimate in artistry. He had a somewhat dimmer view of musicals. <laughs> Since he was such an opera lover, the London Review of Books asked him to write a review of Elton John's pop version of Aida. <laughs> yes, you can imagine. <laughs> this is hard to read. So he wrote, I, I haven't been to a musical play in maybe 40 years. I know nonetheless, a priori, as philosophers say, that I do not like. <laughs> they are noisy and banal and manipulative and vulgar, and the singing is amplified. I know this, as I say, prior to experience and independent of it. Moreover, I am painfully easily embarrassed, and I believe that musicals are the kind of plays in which the actors encourage the audience to come up on the stage and join in the fun. I did not see hair, of course, but I'm certain that everybody in the stalls eventually had to take his, her, mine. <laughs> Jerry goes on to provide in this, in this piece a terrifically amusing and actually quite insightful summary and commentary on the original, Verdi's Aida, and a withering comparison of, to Elton John's pop version, which apparently is a daughter, right? Of course, we took up the same. I was surprised to find he didn't enjoy Bach all that much. He didn't find the writing for Sopranos especially interesting. And when I expressed admiration for the fugues and how extraordinary it must have been for Bach to be able to hear them apparently fully in his head, Fodor exclaimed, yes, enough to drive one insane! <laughs> Indeed, aside from the occasional Beethoven piano sonata, or Mahler symphony, seldom, uh, Jerry seldom really enjoyed any music besides opera. Jerry also loved the theater, and he studied and had rich theories about the entire corpus of Shakespeare's works. But although he and Janet regularly attended plays in New York, his tastes there weren't quite universal. Uh, we, uh, Jen and I once went together to a Tennessee Williams revival, Orpheus Descending, I think, in which poor Vanessa Redgrave had to deliver, in a lush but uncertain approximation of a southern accent, some such line as, Every time I walk past the graveyard, I can hear all those dead people saying, Live, honey, live! All right, I got audibly the giggles. It could happen to anyone. <laughs> Being a, of a depressive uh, turn of mind, he had unusually bleak views about some works. He once argued to me that def the, the defective characters of King Lear are not foolish Lear and his scheming elder daughters, but for him, sanctimonious Cordelia, who naively insists on being sincere in a purely formal con uh, ceremony, failing to realize how such sincerity can bring disaster upon the state. 
On another occasion, in response to my complaint that even a fellow melancholic like myself found the three hammer blows of fate in the last movement of Mahler's Sixth Symphony a bit much, he replied, they're not nearly enough. <laughs> There are heaps of other dark and amusing memories and striking quotes that I'm sure his many friends could and will provide today. I'd be very grateful for any more that others might send along that I'd like to include in the appendix to my mind and language paper, of which this is a short version, uh, uh, and for perhaps a larger collection that I can imagine being eminently publishable along with many of his, you know, quite a few of his uh, less well-known essays. A last memory of my own. A few months before he died, when he had become quite ill, very passive. I went to New York to keep him company for a few days. One thing I thought to do during the visit was to put on a video of what he had once said was his favorite opera, Debussy's Pelias and Amazon. Now this is an opera that I myself really don't much enjoy. And so after watching it with him for about half an hour or so, I turned to him and remembering earlier conversations he and I had about Proust, I remarked, ironic, Jerry, that you love this French claustrophobically personal fantasy opera, and I don't, whereas I love Proust, and you don't. After a few minutes, and what were some of the very few words he spoke to me during that whole visit, he murmured, the music's better. <laughs> he was Jerry to the end. Jerry is survived by his wife, Janet Dean Fodor, a psycholinguist at the CUNY Graduate Center, his daughter, Kate Fodor, a playwright and television writer, a son, Anthony Fodor, a professor of bioinformatics, University of North Carolina, Charlotte, and four grandchildren.